Um, our speaker today is uh, Florian Yeager, actually it's T. Florian Yeager, and I, I actually don't know what T stands for. Maybe we'll remain a minute. Maybe we'll find out. Uh, Florian is uh, currently an assistant professor at the Department of Brain and Cultural Sciences at Rochester. Um, he did his PhD at Stanford in linguistics with a, uh, what do they call it? Designation. In cognitive science, I have no idea what that, what that means. <laughs> uh, his dissertation was on redundancy and syntactic reduction in spontaneous speech, and his research interests really are very broad, but they encompass a lot of work on language comprehension and language production. He's going to talk about some of that research today. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. You know, you you know you've made it when you have a puddle with your name on it. So today, so this was actually the title that I originally in, intended to spend the entire time on, or the topic, speakers' preferences at choice points in language production, and what they tell us about the efficiency in communication. What I actually want to do today is, part one will be about this. Um, I will introduce a hypothesis about efficient production, what makes efficient production, and then I'll show you a lot of experiments and corpus studies on different types of reduction, form reduction in, in speech, in spontaneous speech mostly, um, and show you how this pattern of reduction, and you'll see what that means, will follow a, a principle of efficient production. But then I actually want to spend some time at the end uh, to look at what I would call how, main, how maintenance of linguistic probability <coughs> works throughout adulthood. So I'll actually show you an example of fast adaptation in a, within a single experiment that would argue that uh, comprehenders and speakers probably too uh, adapt to some changes in syntactic probability distributions within just a few trials and that really has severe consequences for how we look at uh, linguistic knowledge but also how we look at experiments that we run um, and balanced designs and such so and overall I should say I'll skip over a lot of details and studies you should stop me whenever you want to know more um, I tend to go relatively fast, uh, but slow me down. And also, the, my, my goal is kind of to give you a lot of uh, things that I would consider like thought-provoking or something like that. So, you know, uh, we don't have to agree with everything, but as long as it's provoking, that's fine. So tell me if it gets boring. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so the first thing I want to talk about is uh, what I call efficiency in production. And I want to be clear that I want to talk about online production. So as you translate your thoughts, into a linguistic utterance, and you go through a series of steps, you don't have to believe into, in, in this particular model where you go from an intended message to grammatical encoding and phonological encoding to articulation, by, of course, this is kind of a gimmick picture, there's a much more detailed theories by now, but basically at all of these uh, points here, functional encoding, for example, what reference will be the subject and so on, and positional encoding, you make choices that you never think about subconsciously, and I'm going to call this choices, um, in terms of how you're going to encode linguistically the message you want to convey. And I want to argue that the choices you make are relatively efficient in terms of maximizing successful information transfer. I'm going to evoke uh, concepts from information theory to argue for that. So I'll, I'll keep that on the low, you know, the, the formulas and so on. So what I mean by choices in quotes here are things like at the highest level, how do you distribute a message across several clauses, several utterances? Right? Um, we hardly ever think about this, but you could say something in ten sentences or one sentence. Right? This is not what linguists usually think of as an alternation, but it has the same characteristic. Move the triangle to the left, select the triangle, move it to the left. Arguably the same information is being transferred here, at least in, in some sense of truth conditional information. Um, and, and yet they uh, differ structurally, they differ in uh, the time course of what you have to do when, and so on. Then we have the prototypical syntactic alternation that has received a lot of attention in social linguistics, variation of linguistics, and so on. She gave him the key. She gave the key to him. Uh, object drop. Uh, she already <coughs> ate. She already ate dinner. In the, in the right context, they can mean the same thing. Um, she stabbed him. She stabbed him with a knife. Um, and then maybe at the word level, some people would argue this is also clearly syntactic. Uh, syntactic. I read a, a book she wrote. I read a book she, that she wrote. Again, for many people, the same message. At the morphological level, in English, we may have contraction, I versus I have. At the phonological level, there's frequent final TD deletion, there's cluster reduction, KTS goes to KS, 
often at the end of words, uh, vowels are being reduced. Um, at the phonetic level, we even uh, know that speakers make choices continuously about how they distribute energy in their vowels, where a more distinctive F1 to F2, so formant ratio, actually makes the vowel more distinguishable from other vowels. Um, so you can put more energy on, on that or less, making the vowel more or less distinguishable, but arguably also leading to more effort, right? So you can, with all of these things, you can actually think about how much form does the speaker have to produce to convey the message versus does that increase the chances of being successful in conveying that message, right? So that's a very old thought. Um, at least uh, this thought a lot about this. Functional linguistics has thought a lot about this. And, of course, in information theory, people have thought about this, too. So the simple uh, theory I want to suggest is what I call uniform information density. This is based on work with Roger Levy. Um, and the simple statement of it goes, given a choice, so where, where grammar permits, uh, speakers prefer to keep the amount of information transmitted per unit time or actually per unit signal uniform, constant. You could substitute that, right? Aim for something that kind of goes like this in terms of distributing information. And I'm going to be actually precise what I mean by information. Information theory tells us that communication through a noisy channel is optimal if information is uniformly close to channel capacity. So there's this somewhat evasive concept of channel capacity, which basically is the, the amount of information per time you can put through a noisy channel but still communicate essentially error-free. It has to do with the amount of a redundancy in your signal in terms of how you encode the message you want to transmit. So even if you don't believe in error-free communication, for any given error rate that I'm willing to accept, there's going to be a maximum amount of transma uh, information per time or signal um, that I can transmit. Um, there's a couple of assumptions that may not be very mm, <coughs> likely to hold for, for real language, and I'm willing to discuss them in, in length uh, links later, and also actually it turns out that the proof here does not depend on this particular assumption. But we should discuss that later for now. Just uh, let's take this uh, intuitive, uh, intuitive metaphor of a noisy channel between, for example, you and me right now, um, and it turns out that in that case there's this maximum of information that I want, don't want to go over, but I also don't want to undershoot all the time because then I'm being inefficient. Right? If I go too high, then I overload and I create a higher rate of error, communication breaks down, if I go under, I'm being inefficient. So I want to find that sweet point that transmits enough information per signal to be efficient, but not too much. That's what this theory is about. And of course, that would then say that uh, we get, during incremental production at all of these things that are just called choice points, that speakers should choose which variant they prefer based on how it distributes information across the signal. Yeah? Okay. So here's a, a, I think, relatively intuitive example that a lot of work has been done on. It's called phonetic reduction. It's been studied a lot in spontaneous speech where uh, people have looked at how predictable instances of the same word differ in pronunciation duration from less predictable instances of the same word. So here it's mind, paid jobs, degrade the mind, versus uh, mama, you've been on my mind. So, great example. <laughs> uh, so... In this case, presumably, mind is less probable in the context here, and it's also longer. And here, it's more predictable, and it's shorter. So this is a pretty well-established finding. It turns out that more probable is the same as less information. Specifically, the Shannon information of any unit is identical to the log of the inverse of that probability, or minus log the probability of that unit. It has all the desirable properties. So, first of all, it makes information additive. Right? So, as you get information, it just adds up. Um, it means that something absolutely predictable is going to have zero information. Right? Probability of zero, uh, probability of one, one by one, makes one, log of one, zero. Right? So, if we take log to the base of two, it gives us bits. So I'm going to be literally talking about bits in language production. Okay? That's what I mean by information at all times during this talk. So now there's a lot of findings here that have shown that word, syllable, morpheme duration uh, is 
uh, nicely modeled by the predictability of those units and context and that they are shorter, the more predictable that instance is. Um, there's also work on arguably phonological alternation, so TV deletion and the reduced versus full vowel that has also suggested that more predictable words choose the reduced uh, phonological variant. And there's work that links the distribution of intonational accents to uh, the predictability of a word. And actually, Eilat and Turk suggested specifically that accents, or intonational accents, are uh, uh, a means of making words longer, that are un words that are unpredictable. I don't think that's true, but, um, you know, this actually directly links intonation to predictability. And there's some work by Borini et al. that shows that predictability, once predictability is accounted for um, linguistic variables like contrast and uh, relations of this partially ordered sets in the context and stuff like that do not contribute significantly to predicting where accents fall, which should be really troublesome. Uh, interrupt sure, interrupt. You know, very quickly, what you mean by predictability in your model? So in, these are all, this is work by other people. Predictability usually uh, is here estimated by a really simple trigram model, so something like uh, the predictability of a word estimated by the two preceding words in context on the corpus of spontaneous speech. So selection of spontaneous speech, I fit a model. In the simplest case, it's a maximum likelihood fitted model that tells me if I see these two words, what's the probability distribution over all words of English following these two words. That's what I'm going to call a trigram model. There are more sophisticated models in some of this work, too, that use maximum entropy, uh, entropy fitting or uh, syntactic probabilistic phrase structure grammars to predict upcoming words. But all of these basically use some sort of computational language model to estimate the probability. A small subset of that work actually uses com humans to estimate probability. So they let lo a large number of uh, people fill out um, like closed studies, basically, right? so to estimate the probability. And those are the best probability estimates, but they're also very expensive. <laughs> <laughs> There's one guy who has selected one million judgments on Russian text, and um, once you do that, you see the advantage it gives you an absolutely beautiful linear relation between the amount of information in a word and the probability as estimated by humans. So. <laughs> okay, so this, this line of work suggests that there is a, a link at the phonological and phonetic level that less form correlates with more predictability and less information. Higher predictability, less information. There's a bit of a caveat here because we do know um, that something like what's called availability-based production or strategic lengthening is going on in spontaneous speech, where if you say pay jobs degrade the mind, and mind is difficult to retrieve, um, so if you have trouble with retrieving mind, uh, actually you will slow down on the preceding words. That's pretty well known. So we also will be more likely to insert the fluencies here or to repeat words. Herb Clark had uh, some really nice studies on this in uh, the late 90s, early 2000s, um, but the, the fact is actually known for a much longer time. And also in syntactic production, you see this pattern. So this is slightly different from what this work that I just reported looked at. So this work looked at how the redundancy of the word the affects the pronunciation of the word the. And redundancy is estimated by the predictability of the word the in its context, either from the left or the right. Confusingly often, actually, predictability from the right context turns out to be the more important factor. <laughs> we can talk about that later. There's actually a reason of, uh, why that is the case. It has to do with the fact that mostly this has been studied on high-frequency words, function words, English, left-headed, uh, sorry, uh, so <laughs> left function words, right, and so on. <laughs> so uh, what I want to show you is just a recent study we did where we looked at this and for the first time controlled for these two um, factors that are affecting pronunciation at the same time. And this is uh, work by Ed Post in the CS department um, at Rochester, and he's graduating this year. So much for subtlety, you know. <laughs> um, what we did uh, is we, we looked at 80,000 words of spontaneous speech that occurred at least 100 times each so that we had good duration estimates, good frequency and predictability estimates for them. And we made sure that they were not themselves a disfluency or that uh, they weren't at the edge of sentences or roughly speaking prosodic boundaries. Um, so between close to large pauses, that's what that means. Um, and that they weren't outliers in terms of the log duration or log speech rate. This is the switchboard corpus of, uh, 
of telephone conversation, mm -hmm. uh, 650 mm -hmm. dialogues. And it has 800,000 words, but only 80,000 of them occur at least at the time. So now we estimate the predictability and therefore the information on a word using a trigram model in this case too, from the left and the right. So the predictability of a word given the two preceding words, predictability of a word given the two following words, we do log because we're talking about information essentially. Um, and we are implementing the availability of the next word in a, in a similar metric. So it's the predictability of the next word given the current word and the preceding word. And we're looking at how these two things affect the duration of the current word. Yeah? Okay. Of course, real language production has a lot of factors in it, so we have to control for a ton of things. Um, speech rate, obviously, has a huge effect on word duration. Uh, preceding pauses or the fluency, smaller pauses or fill pauses like R and um. Um, phonological similarity, OCP effects and such actually affect pronunciation in, in, in online um, production. The frequency of the current word, and whether it's a function word or not. Um, and then we model random effects in these models that we use. These are linear mixed effect models, um, and I can say more about them later. The current word, the following and next word, this is an extremely conservative model because we allow for random variants associated with the identity of the following, preceding, and current word to be eaten up by the random effects in this model. And we want to show that predictability matters beyond all of these things, including individual speaker differences. What we find is the expected effect. In green here, you see redundancy. So more predictable means shorter duration. This is basically the coefficient in the model. It's telling us that more, one increase in predictability, one unit increase in predictability given preceding material corresponds to this decrease in log duration. It's not an intuitive unit, but only the direction matters here. Um, we standardize the effect so that the size of these bars actually tells you something about the strength of, of the effect. You see that more frequent words are shorter. This is actually after modeling random differences between words. So this is a meaningful result. <laughs> I think the first result that clearly shows that more frequent words are shorter in duration after you account for their phonological code. The only other evidence comes from Susan McGall's homophone study, looking at time and time and showing that the more predictable instance is actually more frequent homophone variant is pronounced with shorter duration. Functional words are shorter even after accounting for all of these other effects, so they may have a special status in production. And then crucially, we do find that upcoming material matters, not the predictability, but the raw frequency of upcoming material does affect the current word's pronunciation. But crucially, right now, the redundancy of the current word matters beyond that. So we get that more predictable instances of words are pronounced shorter even after we control for uh, 20 other control factors. Uh, nine, sorry, 18. Two are the ones that are in there. <laughs> and uh, four random effects. Okay. Here's an example of what that means. Here's the predictability of the word given preceding context, the two preceding words. Here's the log shape. This is the log odds. Uh, sorry, this is the, uh, the change in duration. And you can see the more predictable the word, the shorter it gets, and it's the log shape. Now, this varies between words. Just to give you a little bit of a flavor here, if you look at the 10 most frequent words of English, you see that within each of these words, if you refit the model, you find that, of course, not, not everything comes out on every trial. This one was not significant overall, and, of course, it's not significant in any of the models. This is availability. This is the predictability of the next word, which never matters. This is the frequency of the next word, which matters for some of the words. This is the predictability given preceding material and this is the predictability given following material. And you can see again, predictability given following material is actually the more important factor for at least high frequency function words. Okay? So, I know this is probably somewhat uh, unsatisfying. I'm gonna, I skipped over tons of stuff right now, right? But I just wanna give you kind of flavor at this level of detail. And then whenever you ask me, I'll tell you more. So this is how real language looks. Other people also didn't get clean results. Uh, it's not that you see the same effects on every individual word. And we don't know yet. I don't think it's data sparsity. This should be enough. 1,700 instances, 1,000, 1,900, 2,000. You know, like this should be enough data to find reliably 
uh, the effects that we're looking at for all of these words, but we don't find them. So it probably has something to do where these words occur in planning and spontaneous speech, and far more detailed generative models will be ne necessary to model that. I want to... Uh, yes, sorry. Sure. You're doing analysis of the of speaker's data. Yes. So their plan is relevant. Yeah, yeah. This is spontaneous speech. Mm -hmm. you're, you're talking on the phone to, to another person. It's not absolutely natural because you don't know that person at the beginning, so it's awkward, which I guess we experience too occasionally. <laughs> but it's production <laughs> under those circumstances. It's unscripted. You could just get a topic of what to talk about. Now, this is one of the results that I just want to briefly mention. I find it extremely thought-provoking. Um, Okay, let me tell you about it. Uh, it's not directly related, but I want to mention it so that you can think about it. If we refit this model, which has all these other control factors, and now we ask, how should we actually estimate information? What are the cues that real speakers pay attention to while they millisecond by millisecond modulate their speech rate? And just to start, there are several probability estimates in this model, but let's just take this one, the probability of a word given preceding context. So we can ask, should it really be a trigram model? So just conditioning on the two preceding words, should it be, should this model include syntax? Do speakers integrate syntactic information while they millisecond by millisecond estimate the information of the current word and adjust the pronunciation of that word accordingly? If we start doing that, we can derive different models. This is a trigram model. This would be a model that contains syntactic information in terms of the left sister, of the current word, the parent, and the grandparent in the syntactic tree. So it's a probabilistic phrase structure grammar fitted with maximum entropy uh, models and a Gaussian prior. So it's, it's guarded against overfitting the data, basically. The x-axis here is how well this model predicts the next word. Not the duration, but the identity of the next word. This is basically a measure of how good a model this is, right? In terms of predicting words. And you see that some are better, some are worse. That's not so interesting. You put more features in the model, you do the thinning right, it gets better at predicting words. This is how well you predict the duration of the next word. Right? Better models in terms of duration go down here. Better models in terms of predicting words come closer to me. Right? So what this means is, on the one hand, that the best model does actually have syntactic information, and it's best in terms of predicting duration and best in terms of predicting words. So people tend to integrate syntactic information during spontaneous speech. But what I find more interesting is that as the models improve in terms of predicting words, they improve in terms of predicting duration. That's actually a really, really cool finding, if it holds up, because that's what you would expect if people are ideal observers, if they integrate information optimally, if they take maximal advantage of the available information in the light of uncertainty then you should see that the better the model predicts the actual word, it should be a better predictor of what people do, and that's the duration behavior, right? So, something to think about. But for now, um, in the theme of uniform information density, it's just that phonetic reduction is indeed compatible with the efficiency-based accounts. Uh, so, there's some effect of transporting the slides. Anyway, so, next let me give you an example of uh, work by Austin Frank, who is graduating from the BCS uh, program this year in Rochester. And uh, I really like this. this is, uh, he had this idea when I gave my job talk at Rochester, and he said, like, well, couldn't we look at morphological contraction? Couldn't your theory make predictions about this? And there's a very frequent phenomenon in mm -hmm. English and other languages. So you have a sentence like, President Clinton didn't have or did not have, and I guess we all know how that sentence continues. Um, and then we can ask, now as a binomial variable, so binary outcome, uh, is people going to choose this homological realization or this homological realization? We can model the log odds or the probability of that outcome in the model based on the information that having negation at that place carries. Right? And you would expect, based on uniform information density, to get something like this. More information, higher likelihood of the full form. Well, you don't quite get this, you get this. Right? <laughs> Good enough, I say. So, you get a really strong correlation of choosing the full form, the more information that form carries at that moment. 
um, just to walk you through what we actually did here. Oops. So, what is the information of something like M, another contractable item, in context? Well, it's minus log P of the uh, probability of M in that context. What do I mean by M? Oh, sorry, context, I can just use a bigram, so and I in this example. Now, what do I mean by capital AM? I mean both of these words, because we don't want to be circular here, right? I don't want to model the probability of reduced M by the probability of reduced M, right? <laughs> so it's the sum of the, these two probabilities and the information that's indicated by that. So we're really talking about the information contained in the negation in that case, for example, right? So as you can guess from this example, we did actually look at all three types of contractible elements. We excluded all non-contractable instances, or we did our best at least. Many, in many environments have, for example, I have a car in American English is not contractable. I have a car. It does not work, right? Um, and there are other environments for all of these. So we're using a bino uh, binomial mixed model here, so a logistic regression with random effects. Again, we're uh, controlling for complexity of upcoming material, complexity of the host, the type of the host, speech rate, fluency, social effects, women are less likely to reduce than male, that's holds across all reduction phenomena. Um, uh, yet it's, uh, in social linguistics, that's a pretty well-known observed fact. In our models, it's never reached significance, but it's numerically always in the same direction. And of course, random subject differences. Then we fit a model, and I already showed you one result. This is for B, so M is, and so on, um, and this is for all instances of reducible have. You see the same trend in these other two types of morphological contraction, too. If we fit them for all individual instances, like he versus he is, rather than summing over all instances of B, we get the same result for all of these instances. So I'm going to spare you that. Um, that is, of course, as you would expect, by uniform information density. To the best of our knowledge, nobody else had ever looked at contraction and psycholinguistic studies um, and uh, used sentence production theories to predict how this should be distributed. And actually, the other theories that we did control for did not um, do that well. So, next one is we can move to the syntactic level. This is actually where I started off, uh, looking at so-called death omission. Uh, I'll take you through the example of complementizer mentioning first. Some sentence like, my boss confirmed that we were absolutely crazy, versus my boss confirmed we were absolutely crazy. Um, now, even in an environment like this, where one word is completely gone, we can estimate the information of that environment. So the information of this word we at that point there is actually going to be minus log t of a complement clause onset in its context, plus minus log of the probability of the word we, given that you know that there is a complement clause and that you know the context. This is hard to estimate in, because of data sparsity, so I'm going to focus on the first component here. I'm basically going to say the predictability of that syntactic boundary. The more predictable it is, the less information that boundary carries, the less likely speakers should be in spontaneous speech to insert that assuming that it's actually a choice point, right? And I may have failed to account for some constraints, but again, we tried our best to, to only look at environments where you have a choice between that and know that. Intuitively, if you say that we rather than we, you distribute the information of the onset over two words rather than one, again, spreading out information over more signal. If, of course, you have really low information to begin with, you should not insert that because there's no, no need to do so. If we assume some gimmick uh, channel capacity here to keep in line with our metaphor, right? if you below it anyway, there's no reason to reduce information density further. Actually, that would be inefficient. So we should see reduction only for highly unpredictable complement clauses. Oh, sorry, for predictable complement clauses. Uh, and this is what we indeed see. Here's the information of the complement clause onset in bits higher to the right. These are the log odds or probability for the, well, these are the log odds of mentioning that. Right? And it's more likely to mention that as the information content goes up. Thanks. And you can also look at this in probability space. This is identical to the graph I just showed you. But if you like probabilities from zero, zero to one, then you get, of course, 
the different shapes, so you get this different shape of the function, it's identical. This model also controls for a lot of other factors, the complexity of the complement clause. People don't like to say, I believe that that is what we shouldn't do, so they drop that in front of it. I would say it's a lexical level OCP effect. Um, Well-known uh, certain matrix subjects, for example, I think versus he thinks, much more likely to drop that after I think, and that has to do with probably the status of these. There may not even be complement clauses, has been argued. Right? So there's a huge effect. The more complex the subject at the onset is, the more likely you are to produce that. Um, the predictability or information density of the onset of the complement clause, however, is the single most important predictor. It captures more um, information than in the dependency predictors or fluency predictors altogether. So it's uh, really strikingly important. There are other environments. For example, a president who is adored by most of us would have no need. And you probably also know which president I mean. The evading in my mind, when you drop that, mm -hmm. is it grammatically correct or does it matter? So there may be there, um, are arguably some environments where it's not grammatically correct, and we did our best to exclude them. So as a matter of fact, in this database, there are only instances of complement clause to verbs that are observed are both reduced and unreduced. So we know, we know for a fact that for that environment, that and that was not was both possible. Right? And, I, and there are clearly many examples where it's perfectly grammatical. Right? So I wouldn't consider this a mistake or error or anything like that. This is just another type of reduction. We looked at a, a bunch of different types of reduction. This is subject extracted passive relative clauses. And here you can omit the who is. It's again, grammar permits you to do that. Um, and again, you should see more information, uh, more likely to actually insert the who is. And that's what we find, both as estimated from the left or estimated from the right. So hopefully it gets boring at this point. And <laughs> um, given the time, I'm going to give you only one example. We've done a lot. So, so far, you've seen only corpus studies, but we've also done lab studies using so-called recall paradigms. This is Roger Levy and uh, Vic Ferreira. Um, in San Diego, and this is actually for uh, non-subject extracted relative clauses. So that's the painting they told me about. Same idea again, we can estimate the information here. If you insert that, that's the painting that they told me about. You distribute the information over more words, right? And now you can, there was an initial evidence from corpus studies that this is a very nice predictor of reduction. This was work with Tom Watto, my thesis advisor, and Dave Orr who's now a professional poker player and makes more money than me, uh, well, at least than I. Uh, and so we, we thought we wanted to study this um, in the lab just to make sure. So basically, you can use properties like whether it's this is a book, the book, the thickest book. Hopefully, you already get the intuition that relative clauses become more predictable as you go down here. This is the thickest book. You really expect something Right? The main qualification, basically. And any definite determiner needs some sort, anything that uh, makes the whole NP um, meet the uniqueness requirement of the definite determiner. And relative clauses are one way to do that. So relative clause probability goes up, information density goes down. That's actually nicely correlated based on corpus studies with the percentage of that in the other direction. So you can use properties also, for example, how semantically contentful the head noun is, house versus place. You're much more likely to omit that after house. And so you can use properties like this in experiments to investigate whether that omission goes uh, in line with this. And let me just show you this one example. We did the simplest thing. The amendment was a quick resolution that the legislator implemented versus the amendment was the quickest resolution that the legislator implemented. You know you know now in a psycholinguistic experiment because the sentences get weird, right? <laughs> it's not spontaneous speech anymore. Um, we tested this in two sentence environments which turn out not to matter. So let me skip over this. The prediction is that the quickest compared to a quick makes a relative clause more predictable and therefore should result in lower that mentioning. The paradigm is that you see the sentence, the amendment was a quick resolution that the legislator implemented, you see a math problem. Actually, you hear the sentence, you see a math problem, you solve the math problem, and then you see a cue. 
and hopefully you get the intuition that that's pretty difficult, so you lose a lot of data in these kinds of paradigms. Um, we did this with written production too, and then you lose 20% data rather than 60. So, but of course, then it's written production. So, you know, you have to think about that. Um, let's skip over this. I'll give you the results. Basically, independent of sentence context, we find that you're more likely to mention that, this is the probability of that, after A quick than after B quickest, which is expected. We actually then ran a norming study on the web and in the lab to replicate it. Uh, asking uh, people to complete sentences to find out what the real probability of a relative clause was for that type of a sentence. Mm -hmm. We used that to fit a model to predict the predictability of a relative clause, this model. So probability of a relative clause given the item and the condition you're in. We derive the information density of the relative clause from that and use it to predict that mentioning and you get the positive correlation that you've seen in a couple of graphs now already. Right? So you see again, high information density at the relative clause onset in this experiment correlates with higher log odds and therefore higher probability of mentioning that. And this is a different syntactic environment than the ones I showed you before. So if you don't trust Mechanical Turk, we did this in the lab too. We used forced choice rather than completion. It gives us slightly better correlation. So I showed you the worst result. Um, I encourage you to look at our lab blog, hlplab.wordpress.com, where there are several posters uploaded that do plenty of replication of mechanical term web-based experiments versus lab-based experiments. So I think I'm going to skip over this. I'm going to do a lot of skipping. It's all according to prediction. Um, and then uh, this is actually kind of a cool effect. Let me just briefly mention it. We manipulated relative clause predictability by preceding context by having a multiple reference context. So the cashier scans seven hats and three shirts, the hat. You really expect a relative clause versus the cashier scans several types of clothing, the hat, which has lower relative clause predictability. Even this manipulation <coughs> correlates in the predicted direction with that mentioning, which means that these facts cannot be purely lexicalized or grammaticalized unless you think that you store all contexts you ever encounter. Okay. Um, yes, that, yes, that we, we skipped over. Oh, which one? I guess the, the question I have and I'm wondering other is how do you interpret the change in slopes? For something like this? Well, across them. Oh, the change of story. Uh, so, well, all our information density estimates are really bad, right? I mean, we're nowhere close to what humans really do. Like, if you have a trigram model and you estimate the probability of something on a preceding context, or if you have a norming study where you ask 10 people, and, or like 20 or whatever, right, and get an estimate of the relative cross probability, you're not going to find the real, real estimate. Um, yeah, this one here I should actually mention. In this last study, this slope does not reach significance yet, but you can see there's very little data. Each data thing here is one data point. This was in progress. If you look at the qualitative result, it goes in the predicted direction. But yeah, the change of slope, we don't think much about yet because basically our models are so crappy that we don't have to worry about that. Crucially <laughs> so, the crappiness of the model should not bias in our favor. <laughs> it just increases the noise. Yeah, good question, thanks. <laughs> so what I want to say at this point is that at these levels we looked at so far, we find the same result over and over, that higher information corresponds to more form. Um, there's also very nice evidence from object drop, where Philip Resnick in 96, before anybody thought about this, showed that verbs that are likely to omit their arguments, like eat, right, I already ate, or um, the US won the semifinals, right, the US won, uh, that these verbs are also verbs that carry a lot of and, uh, information about the types of semantic arguments they have. So that, this doesn't quite show what I've shown so far for the, the cases I discussed, but it shows that on average these verbs tell you more about the types of arguments they have, making them more predictable. More specifically for anybody who, who this means something to, it's the relative entropy of those verbs with the types of semantic arguments they take that is uh, high for them. I could blah blah on about the fluencies and gestures, about biclausal versus monoclausal choice, one sentence versus two sentences to say the same thing, about morphological reduction in Yucatec Maya, 
about the distribution of information across 12 different languages, including spoken Mandarin, Chinese, and spoken English. The result is the same in all of these cases. And I'm happy to talk individually about any of these studies. Um, I think this is insane. You <laughs> There you go. Um, what I would tentatively conclude is that, as far as we see so far, that at all of these levels, you see this correlation of form and information. So that would mean that there's evidence that language production is efficient. Let me remind you that this distribution is what you would expect if you want to shoot a close to channel capacity but don't go over it. Right? You want to make things that are unexpected in context, you want to give more signal for them to be comprehended, for example. That would be the audience design interpretation of this result, right? But this is at a, at a more general level, you're just saying provide more cues when something is unexpected. That's one way to look at this result, right? Whether you believe that or not, the results all suggest that information density drives speakers' decisions at various choice points of linguistic representation. And that means that even if that theory is wrong, we have to think about information density as something that makes something to produce complex, right? not just the number of words. We have actually studies where, where we compared the number of words, the number of syntactic nodes in a phrase as a complexity measure against information density. And information density consistently shows up to matter beyond that. And that also means that our ability to use language includes access of somehow the system has that inherent property to, to be able to consult probability distribution. I do actually not think that there's like this little central uh, computing unit that uh, calculates uh, information density. Rather, it's a property of the architecture of the language production system that it has access to probability distribution. That shouldn't be so shocking in this day and age anymore, but it's, it's worth stressing. Why is it the case? Because information is defined probabilistically. There are different concepts of information, but all of them make uh, reference to probability distribution. Whether you take Fisher information or Shen information, it doesn't matter. Um, I don't know how interesting this is here. Um, there's an obvious question about how this computational level theory relates to mechanistic theories that is the level of representation that most psycholinguists usually do their work at when we talk about something like, I slow down when I don't know how to continue. Right? Um, and I, I'd say let me not discuss this in detail, let me skip over it, and um, if there are questions, I can say more about it. There are some links to mechanistic theories that I think lead to an intuitive implementation of uniform information density at the mechanistic level. Um, but uh, I actually like that this is a computational level theory and that it stays neutral of certain mechanistic um, interpretations because I'm not sure that mechanistic uh, representations are the a priori God-given right ones, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, anyway. What? How much time do I have right now? Yeah, 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Okay. Yeah, I think I can do that. So, I pointed at the beginning to the fact that the metaphor of the noisy channel is somewhat of a stretch for for human language use, which may call into question the very fact that I said this is optimal under that interpretation. So it's not the fact that there isn't a noisy channel between us. There clearly is a noisy channel between us. But Shannon's proof in information theory actually applies to digital channels. Now, you can make any analog channel we clearly you're using an an so analog source, sorry. Like I'm producing a continuous signal, I'm not tick, 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 right? Um, so you can, of course, translate any um, continuous signal into a digital signal with really high accuracy, right? So the proof does extend to some extent, but there's some other assumptions that have to do with really, really how in the, the guts of that proof work that I think make it questionable that this is the right way to think about um, the optimality of uniform information density. It does turn out that there is a maybe more intuitive, similar but actually subtly different interpretation of why you would get uniform information density. And that has to do with processing difficulty rather than maximizing the information that you successfully transfer through the noisy channel. That may seem very similar, but it's actually different, right? So if I minimize uh, processing difficulty, 
I also get this result that this is opti would be the theoretically optimal thing to do. This is work with Roger Levy, um, who has also worked a lot on comprehension and uh, has shown that comprehension is uh, surprisal sensitive. Surprisal is the same as channel information. It's minus log of the probability of unit and has been shown to be a very good predictor of how long you spend in reading a word, for example, or understanding the word. Just conceptually, don't be afraid. Um, what Roger actually showed in his thesis for comprehension is that if you think of a comprehender parallelly parsing incrementally as words come in, what the, what the likely structures are, right? And you have a parallel parser. And in each word that you see, you have to re-rank your hypotheses, which are probabilistic, right? And you, they're ranked according to their probability. And now you can ask about the probability distribution after seeing word i compared to i minus 1. So you've just seen a new word, a new piece of evidence. Now you have to adjust the distribution of your hypotheses about the parse. This is relative entropy or kohlberg leibler which is a measure of the distance between two probability distributions. It turns out, so John Hale suggests that this measure of surprisal, which is the same as information, I hope you recognize this, right? So it's the surprisal of word I, given everything you've seen before. And what Roger showed is that this is identical to the kohlberg leibler under the assumption um, uh, of probabilistic phrase structure grammars. So it actually turns out that representation neutrally, you can estimate the information carried by a word based on its preceding context, and that should correlate with its comprehension difficulty. And whoops, this got screwed up. Uh, over the years now, since 2005, there have been a lot of experiments that have shown that surprisal correlates quite nicely with comprehension time. Um, and basically, this led to this formulation that <coughs> comprehension difficulty, or maybe more generally processing difficulty, uh, is somehow a polynomial of surprisal, right? So surprisal is our minus log p of the unit, for example, the word, and now we just say it's a polynomial, right? So some function of surprisal. And as long as we assume that k is larger than 1, which means that surprisal is super, that reaction times are superlinearly related in surprisal, so more than linear. I hope it's somewhat a little bit intuitive. If you assume this, then uniform information density is optimal. If it was less than one, there's no way it can be less than one, because if it was less than one, you should put all the information on one word. That would be the optimal thing to do. Right? <laughs> the, the bigger, the more, the larger it is, if it's bigger than one, you should distribute it evenly. If it's exactly one, it doesn't matter how you distribute information. So you can show that under that interpretation, UAD is also optimal. So let me... Uh, okay, let me just uh, let's see how to do this. So I want to show you one comprehension experiment where we took data from a corpus, data from relative clause, a relativizer emission. So it's sentences with that and without that. We randomly sampled them to be representative of the range of examples in the corpus. Twelve originally had that. Twelve originally didn't have that. Basically, I'm, I'm trying to get at the processing intuition here. Now, these are sentences like, the way that we've been managing or the ball that he hit wasn't a strike. So these are real sentences again, right? They come from, in this case, the Wall Street Journal. Um, we create, the region of interest is going to be this because this is what is surprisal sensitive. This is the region where we measure reading times um, that, that should be sensitive to the predictability of a relative clause, to the information density of the relative clause onset. We create the counterpart of each stimulus, which was the one not observed in the Wall Street Journal. Right? If you did have that, we remove it. If you didn't have it, we insert it. So now, this is what we find. We find that on the subject at the beginning of the relative clause, we find that if originally the stimulus had that and you remove it, you get slower at the onset of the relative clause in reading. That helps comprehension, right? Big surprise. If originally you did not have that, and you insert that, you get faster. Again, that helps comprehension. Cool result is this. <laughs> the original examples with that, and the original examples without that, on average, led to the same comprehension difficulty on the subject region. 
I re-ran that experiment because I don't believe this, this is too perfect, right? This can't be right. And there needs to be more experiments of this type. I replicated exactly like this, but I re-ran the exact experiment. So it wasn't the subject related to the screw up or anything like that. But it could, of course, be something about the items or something like that. So this has to be done uh, a couple of times before I really believe it. But this would strongly argue that speakers actually uh, regulate whether they insert that based on the processing difficulty that would otherwise uh, results uh, on the comprehender, or maybe for the speaker, you know, they, they haven't actually said that yet. Yes. So I hope that's thought-provoking too, because that could have potentially quite severe consequences. Something to consider is this was the Wall Street Journal, Wall Street Journal has editors, so maybe it was the comprehender. Mm -hmm.